folks, whether it be from academia, whether it be from the field, uh, NHR, or be uh, from uh, different labor union organizations, our affairs mediators, employment labor attorneys, we all come together. Uh, and you'll see uh, the room's not full, but we actually have enough registered to fill the room up. So some people will come and go, I'm sure, based on their work schedules. Uh, and if you're here, we know the busy people. <laughs> okay, so we know based on the work that you do that uh, it's important and relevant to the field of labor management relations, and we're just glad you're here. We're also glad to have some students here this year. I think about three years ago, we started inviting students to this conference, and so I asked the practitioners to kind of take them under the wings, let them learn about uh, what you do and how much uh, you know, that rel how relevant that labor management relations is. They don't get that necessarily in the classroom, okay? So I appreciate your help with that. Uh, what I'd like to do since we have such a small group here this morning, um, it is, it's just an introduction. But before I go, I introduce myself. Uh, I'm Kim Beaver. I am this year's president of Terra, and I think this is about my 12th conference uh, with the organization. And uh, this is something I look forward to every year. Uh, and it's, it's an opportunity to really network uh, instead of the broad range of professionals um, and appreciate those different perspectives. Uh, I'm also joined here with several officers today. There'll be more that are coming. Uh, Cam Bennett up front, Richard Hanner, Cam. Okay. Got Van Tenpenny over here. He's going to be a photographer this, uh, this week or uh, next few days uh, for this conference. Uh, one of the things that we started doing a few years ago, we started videotaping our present presentations and putting on our website. So, that's, so if there's a presentation that you particularly would like to view again, you can go back on the website and take a look at it. Uh, in fact, I didn't know this, but um, one of my fellow faculty actually posted my presentation for my students to view. Uh, in a class because it had been live streamed into the uh, website. So I'm like, oh, I know that person. But, uh, but it's a way for you to go back and, and review some material. We have a lot of good stuff. But this is just one stop shopping when you're talking about having so many diverse uh, labor management professionals in the same room. So it's going to be a great three days. Um, we're looking forward to it. Also, a board member I have with me is behind my connection behind me here, Bill Canick. Uh, I want to really thank Bill for all the work he's done in organizing this conference. He's really the backbone um, of scheduling the programming and working with our presenters to get them here. So we really appreciate that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and start a brief introduction. Just let us know your name and uh, where you're from so that um, you kind of know who you can network with here today. I'll start over here on this side. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Banks. I'm a member of United Steelworkers, Local 1155, and this will be my second conference. My name is Robert Mariotti. I'm actually with the State of Tennessee Department of Labor. I do work on mediations, and then I'm also working on the HBA team. I'm Mike Foster, I'm the city administrator, city manager for the city of Denver, Tennessee. I'm an ex post officer, ex sheriff, uh, ex military. Thank you. Hey, my name is Kevin Bale, I'm a local uh, 327 Teamsters. I'm a uh, work here at the base here for ABC. I'm Jimmy Nance. I'm the president of Arrington here in the Middle Grades Council out here in Arlington. It's good to be here out there. I've been about 10 or 12 years ago. I'm Carl Hill. I'm the 846 uh, local out of Chattanooga. It's my first conference. Um, I'm here in Arnold as well. Hello, my name is Austin Ramsey. I'm a student at Penn State University, Human Resource Manager. Also, go to the last part of the video. Vice President of Mayor Board with uh, Student Church. Brian, get it out. 
Here in Alcana with uh, Athens Day, also professor on the COVID project for the Sherman Financial School of Life. My name is Tiffany Gaiman. I am an IT Medical State University. I'm the Vice President of Communications for the Sherman chapter, and I'm also the chair. Diane Hamlin, I am a senior at Athens Day, major in management, and I'm a human job. Okay. I'm Tim Laporte, I'm a student at Athens Day. I'm majoring in human resources, and I'm the vice president of Orange and the Shirt. I'm uh, Steve Hawkins, I'm the Tennessee OCA administrator. I'm Steve uh, Ursula Liger, and I'm actually talking here, so that's the Mississippi Center. Don't steal my thunder, Steve. <laughs> Cameron Bennett, uh, they call me Cam, I am. Uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, local 429 Nashville. Uh, I'm also a member of the Secretary for a few terms, as uh, well as the past president and uh, current uh, board member there. Uh, I've been a Tiffany Gaiman, president elect of the Terra. Uh, President of the National Association and the uh, Prime Secretary for the Institute of the Great. I heard you're like I said, we can know a lot more people throughout the next three days, and we will have folks come in based on their work schedules and travel schedules, some fly in and uh, leave their different time. So we think that we need to network because this, this is where it's really advantageous at this, uh, to, to talk with folks, you know, normally get to talk to an individual basis and, and learn from each other. All right, with no further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Bill and let Bill introduce our first speaker. Okay, I turned this one on. Thank you very much. Um, delighted to have you all here. I'm sure on this uh, cold ish and increasingly cold uh, fall day here in uh, Tennessee, we'll be uh, having more people uh, arrive shortly to pick up their name tags. Um, it, it's an enormous pleasure, and I'm, we're all really honored to have with us today uh, the director for the Center for Workers' Compensation Studies at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, um, one, of, uh, one of the quiet and enormously influential uh, organizations uh, on our, uh, in our uh, federal government. Um, I, I w when I was driving down this morning uh, from Nashville, where I live, I uh, uh, heard not for the for uh, for the um, a very common uh, story for me, which was uh, uh, National Public Radio reporting once again on uh, a the results of a study that was conducted by NIOSH, um, and so uh, it uh, it made me uh, all the more proud that we could. Uh, uh, have this great relationship between Terra and NIOSH for these many years, where every year we've had in our opening session, um, except for the year that the government was sequestered, uh, in which uh, we were all kind of uh, sequestered by that uh, that year. Um, in his role as Director of Workers' Compensation Research, uh, Steve Wurzelbacher coordinates workers' compensation, trending analyses, and safety and health intervention effectiveness studies with both public and private research partners. Um, he's worked for over 16 years in the safety and health field as both a researcher and a loss control practitioner for workers' compensation insurance carriers. He has a doctorate in occupational safety and ergonomics from the University of Cincinnati, and I believe he's a Reds fan. <laughs> because you're born in Cincinnati, weren't you? There you go. That's how, um, and and we respect that, and we hope to one day see them in postseason. <laughs> so, indeed, not as much as the Cubs. <laughs> so, but we wouldn't wish that on anybody. Um, and so, uh, he's a certified professional ergonomist, um, and holds an associate in risk management. Uh, and so I um, don't want you all bringing your aches and pains to him or complaints about your chairs. But uh, we're delighted to have him. He drove down this morning from Cincinnati 
and uh, I'm going to get out of his way. So, Steve, um, if, if you'll just signal me when you want me to advance slides, right. okay? All right, well, thanks very much for having me today. It was uh, a bit of a long haul this morning, longer than I thought, so I pretty much was eating a subway on the way uh, here real quick and so forth, so if I have anything in my teeth, that's why. Um, the extra uh, veggie. <laughs> so as, I, um, as Bill was saying, I'm, I'm from NIOSH, and that's the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. If you want to advance that, that slide. Um, one more there. Um, we are basically the federal agency that is responsible for doing <clears throat> occupational safety and health research and recommendations. And we do differ from OSHA, even though we have another Steve from OSHA here. The next slide here kind of points out the difference between the research and the regulation. Um, NIOSH and OSHA were created under the same OSHA Act 1970, uh, but one is designed to do research under HHS, while OSHA is through the Department of Labor and regulation. So um, we do work uh, closely with, with OSHA, um, and it, in essence, what we're trying to do is, is come up with evidence-based safety and health uh, recommendations and practice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the center is but one aspect of NIOSH. Uh, there are a number of different departments and a number of different centers. NIOSH, the Center uh, for uh, Workers' Compensation Studies, is a little bit about a year and a half old. Um, we've actually, in the last year, started to, to uh, put out different centers. Um, one that actually is brand new is called the Center for Direct Reading Instruments. So if you're an industrial hygienist, there's now a center out there that looks at um, you know, issues with direct reading instruments, uh, uh, noise dissimilars, and so forth. And we're actually going to have a new one coming out on the aging workforce. Um, but the Center for Workers' Compensation Studies um, basically has been around for about a year and a, ha a half. And our focus is on big data. And I realize when I show this slide, a lot of people don't know, get, get the joke because they don't know what Star Trek is anymore, but uh, that tall guy's data, you know. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about workers' comp data, uh, most people think of claims uh, data. When somebody gets hurt, there's a claim that's produced. And that is the main focus, what I'll talk about the rest of today. But the other part is, is that there is quite a bit of information that insurance companies collect on employers in terms of exposures and controls. Uh, just for example, uh, insurers are one of the biggest uh, collectors in terms of industrial hygiene sampling. And a lot of times that data is collected, it's given in terms of reports to the employers, but it's not really utilized beyond that. So one of the things that we're trying to do is really tap this huge resource, especially in terms of claims. Uh, each state does collect information from employers and insurance companies in the state about claims. It differs by state exactly what they collect, um, but some collect actual reports of medical only and lost time cases. And in single states, this can be millions of claims. Uh, California, for example, has about 600,000 uh, workers' comp claims a year. Uh, so you can imagine, if you look at the information behind that, even if it's just the basic narrative of slipped on ice, hurt my back, that sort of idea, you can really start to mine that for prevention purposes. And it's, it's very unique in that it's the only source that we have that gives both an information about the cause of the injury and then also the diagnosis of the injury. Um, in essence, that's any place you get that. Uh, so there is this, this tremendous potential, but it's largely been un underutilized. Um, each state collects it, but not many states really leverage what they collect. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a number of challenges. Um, one thing is, is that you know, we do need detailed workers' compensation data for evidence-based loss control, but if you're a small insurance company, you don't necessarily have this big book of data and, and business to look at. Uh, so you really are kind of looking at external benchmarking sources. And again, most states really don't put out information about what's happening in, in their states in workers' comp, at least in regards to uh, injury by cause, for example. So that's a big thing that we're trying to get out, um, is encourage states to each benchmark the data by industry and then causation so we can really use it for pre prevention purposes. And then there are issues once you actually get the data, how can you actually use it to prioritize what you're doing for research and prevention? Next slide. So there's this whole opportunity to, to tap this potential of the data in data that's already collected um, by most of the states. 
And so in essence, what we're trying to do with a number of different states, um, and actually following the leads of, of different states that have already done this, is that you can take that data that's collected by uh, the State Workers' Comp Bureau, for example, in the state, and link it to the employment agency data in the state that gives the number numbers of employees by industry. So by doing that, you can actually create rates out of the data that you see in terms of numbers of injuries per number of workers per industry. Um, and again, it's not actually collecting any new data, it's just zipping up the data that you do have. Um, and once you do that, that's, that's a big part of the challenge, but after that, what you have in a lot of these, these big seas of data is that it's mostly unstructured data. It's like the text and the Twitters and all that stuff. There's, it's all this just unstructured data. So we have a big challenge to how, how to actually code and structure that, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, things we've done with that data. But once you can get to it, it really is the best source of the data, um, source of injury and illness prevention data in the country. Oops. So as far as our center goals, they're, they're basically uh, two types. The first is surveillance, and, and that idea is to work with states to provide the best data that they can in terms of uh, trending by industry and cause. Um, and essentially that's what we're trying to do right now is we have a grant program that I'm going to talk about a little bit later that's going to fund up to nine states uh, to not again collect any new data, but just use the data that they have and create partnerships between their workers' comp folks and the Department of Health in the state. So that's the first goal is really about surveillance. And once you have the data, then you can actually use it to figure out in each state what's, what's the priority, what's the emerging risks, and then also use it through research to identify um, <coughs> evidence-based interventions. I'm gonna talk about later on a program that's sponsored by the state of Ohio called the Safety Intervention Grants. And it's been around since about 1990. Eight, and what they do is they actually pay for engineering controls to be put in place in, in uh, different employers and they follow them forward in time. On that uh, thumb drive that you were given is the results of the paper we just did on that study. And if you go through it, it, it goes through each different type of intervention. There's about 468 companies and it shows you know, just how effective was a lift table versus a, a machine guarding versus you know, different other types of controls. So in, in essence, basically, it, really did show us that it does work, safety does work, and uh, it's kind of surprising. You would think that's something that should be out there all the time, but if you really look at what's been published, there's not a lot that actually shows that exact thing. So um, again, we're looking, looking to partner with more insurers and, and states to do this sort of evidence-based prevention. Next slide. So there are a number of different insurance companies, uh, for example, that have taken the lead in this area. Liberty Mutual, I'm sure everybody probably knows about Liberty Mutual, and, and they have a safety index that they put out every year uh, that goes into how many billions of dollars are spent according to by, by what cause of injury. Um, on the public side, like Liberty Mutual, the state of Washington is, is actually the insurance company for that state, and they actually put out each year um, reports on, on their data. And this is just from their latest report. Um, on the actual uh, PDF of, the, of this presentation, there is a link to this, this report. Um, and this goes through 2002 to 2010 data. And what they do is they break it out by cause, um, just like the Liberty Mutual, what's happening in their state. And you can see that um, you know, from their data, a lot of it is still like ergonomic related, slip, trip, fall, and then these other injuries is struck by and struck against. And that's pretty much been the same story for a number of years. Um, next slide. The is difference it, with- Is this for all industries? This is for all industries, yeah. Basically, this is uh, across industries by cause. And what, if you dig into that report, what they do is they actually go into each industry and then do that same sort of pie chart by different industries. Um, and what's neat about the data is that it is all rate-based. So you can see the number of claims, for example, in construction, uh, but also per 100 full-time equivalents. So you can do rates of claims. Um, and so you can actually see who's the highest. In this, this slide, construction is the highest. Um, but then they also have the cost data as well. Um, I definitely encourage you to take a look at that report because it's, it's very detailed and, and it's very, um, you know, even though it's, it's about Washington, there's other lessons that can be learned. But the point is, is that, um, you know, every state is collecting data in a, in a way like this data. And 
we just want to encourage as much as possible that data be, to become available in every state because you know, again, this is Washington, but it might not be reflective of what's happening in, in your state. So we are trying to get that out as, as a center goal. Next slide. So a big part of what we're trying to do with our center is really support anybody who is interested in doing uh, trending with workers' compensation data. Um, the, through really our partnerships, we've learned a lot about uh, data in terms of, you know, say the Ohio data that we've been working with. And there's lots of different tricks that can get people much further down the road if, if you're going to go to, to analyze your data. Um, and so this, what I'll talk about is just our basic surveillance support uh, to begin with. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, really this whole goal of capacity building or really helping the states just analyze the data that they have is a key role of what we're trying to do. And in the end, it's just about getting, uh, again, industry and cause data that's rate-based. And so what we've been doing for uh, the last year is, is doing webinars where we show some different methods that you can use to link those two sources that I talked about, the first report of injury and then the, the information on employment, numbers of employees and industry, that then you can get rates. Um, there's, you know, some back and forth as far as some of the details that go in. And so we basically have, have gone through and put out some methods that you can go through to used to do adjustments because <clears throat> most of the counts that you get from the state are just numbers of employees, but part and full time. So if you go to compare across industries, you definitely have to adjust it to full time employees. So you're not um, basically, you're comparing industries that have different ratios. You wanna do that adjustment first to make it equitable. And there's things like inflation adjustment as well that anytime you're dealing with cost data that you wanna go through. So this has been a big fo focus of us and we have been uh, working really with uh, our key partners in Washington State and Ohio, but others as well, as I mentioned, through this uh, grant program. So with Ohio, um, we kind of have a, a key benefit with being with Ohio in that we're located, one of our major NIOSH locations is in Ohio. So it's kind of natural that we develop this partnership. Ohio is a uh, exclusive state, so it is, an it is the actual insurance company for the state. Um, and we've had a partnership with them since about 2010, um, but have done work really over the last 20 or 30 years with them. Um, and back in 2010, though, we did develop a partnership where we agreed that we would work on their, their database and, and take it on to do this trending. And so what we did is, is, is take about 1.4 million claims and link it at the employer level that we do have now rates of, of claims by industry. And not just by industry, but also at the employer level, so we can see high and low employers. Um, I should say, in this whole relationship, NIOSH never gets the identity of the, the people or the employers. It's all about understanding the unit as an employer, but it's not to uh, use it necessarily for enforcement. In fact, with with how Ohio deal, deals with it, and every state's different, is this, that the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Comp does not actually share that data with the OSHA program in the state um, at the employer level, but they do actually talk about industry trends. So, um, so a big thing is we took this database and a, a problem with it was is that it didn't have any kind of <coughs> cause coded into it. And so we worked with others that were developing auto coding methods and we managed to basically auto code the claims, which you know you can't actually go through 100 or 1.4 million claims by, by hand. And so we had to go through these methods um, and then QC them afterwards. So, so this coming year, basically, we're going to be producing much like Washington State did, the same sort of data in, in Ohio. Um, again, it's an example of, of just by industry what's happening in that state and then trends over time. And so a big thing of what we're trying to do with the data internally as well is then share it with internal NIOSH folks. Um, and there's a whole range of projects that are going on um, with the data itself. Um, for example, we have a researcher looking at nail gun claims. And so they asked, well, can we look at the database and figure out if the nail gun claims occurred? And, and you can, I mean, because you do have both the narrative, the, the text that tells what happened, and then you have the diagnosis. So you, you have enough information that you can identify things like nail gun claims. Um, we have another one looking at uh, certain industries like mining, there's a big uh, hydraulic fracturing uh, industry change in Ohio, so that's something that, that the state is interested in, and so we can look at that as well. Um, other focus 
type areas that we can get into are healthcare violence is, is one that came into effect that uh, we can look at that and just as a patient and a, and a caregiver uh, that's come through quite a bit. And, um, and they, these are happening in other states as well. Maine has a, a program out where they've looked at that as well. And so we're modeling a little bit off that. Um, and just recently, amputations and traumatic brain injuries has been another one. Um, in fact, Michigan actually just did a, a study on traumatic brain injuries, and uh, we'll be coming up with one very shortly as well. So, so this is just kind of a little snippet of what we're doing in Ohio. Next uh, slide here. And when you do get the data at the, at the uh, industry level, you can do something called like a prevention index. And this is just a basic, very basic way to try to prioritize. So you're going to have some uh, sectors that have a lot of claims, and then you're going to have some sectors that have a high rate of claims. And a basic way to address that is just take a rank of both of those and average them. For example, manufacturing has the most claims in Ohio. Um, which isn't surprising, but it, it, it basically has the most in terms of claims. But it, when you actually look at the rate of claims per 100 workers, it's third. If you average this two, you get number two. So it gives you an idea that, um, you know, manufacturing and construction are still very much uh, key areas for prevention of, of injuries in Ohio. Um, this is just at a basic sector level. We actually have it at a very detailed level as well to say if I was interested in owning manufacturing, well, we could drill into manufacturing and say who has the highest rate of claims in, in, in manufacturing and then by what cause. And so it's very helpful in terms of uh, prioritizing when you do, what you want to do for research and prevention. Right, next slide. So as I mentioned, a big thing that we're trying to do is get the word out just through webinars. We know that travel is tight for everybody. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not easy to get to a place in person, so we've been sponsoring webinars where we get different speakers to come in and talk. And a big thing is, is we're not trying, we're trying to get others to talk. It's not like NIOSH knows it all. It's, it's through our partners that we learn a lot of things. For example, we had um, a person from Vanderbilt, Martha Jones. Uh, she has been very big in, in looking at different sources that you can use for injury denominators, basically. And uh, she has been very helpful and has done a couple of different um, presentations for us. And we also went through this thing with the causation auto coding. And in that, we stood on the shoulders of a lot of people who have done that for years. Uh, for example, <coughs> Liberty Mutual and Purdue University both had people working in that area. As, as uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, I know we're going to have somebody talking from there later. We had a, some folks from BLS talk as well. Um, OSHA and, you know, don't want to take away from what Steve's going to talk about, but, you know, we know that a lot of folks are doing the, the auto coding because by nature of what you're doing, you can't go through all these claims by hand. You have to auto code. So everything we're doing and, and these others are doing, we're trying to get the word out and share the actual program. And so if anybody's interested, we can certainly do that. And the reason that cause is important is, is that, um, you know, in the past, a lot of like workers comp analyses have just talked about diagnoses, so like back sprain. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I was in school and so forth, when I'm, we were talking about back sprains, my area was ergonomic. So I assumed, well, all back sprains are ergonomic. Well, it's, it's actually not true. If you look at this, this is just a um, summary of some of the data from Ohio. And the far left gives the claim count and then the diagnoses and then the cause. So what it's saying in, in terms of the claim count, at the bottom, there's 164,000 uh, claims that are sprains to the back, but only 73% of them were ergonomic related, but a full, almost 20% were due to slip, trip, fall. So if someone slips and then they try to catch themselves and they wrench out their back, that re results in a back strain as far as the diagnosis, but it had a completely different cause. Um, and that's the one that's actually, if you, you know, as a majority, it's still going to be ergonomic related, but if you look at upper extremity, for example, in the middle, you know, only about 58% of those are ergonomic related, and actually 24% of them are caused by slip or falls, and 18% from other types of issues, including workplace violence, can be included in that. In the lower extremity, it actually slips the whole other way, in that 82% uh, of the lower extremity sprains are actually caused by slip or falls. They're not caused by ergonomic issues. So, you know, going to the level of diagnosis isn't enough for prevention. We really have to get to a combination of both. And uh, 
once we get to that, we can actually prevent these types of accidents. And you know, one of the focus that we're taking now is taking this sort of analysis and looking at it in the age of the worker. And we're starting to find some interesting trends that younger workers get hurt differently than older workers by how it's caused. And actually, when they actually get hurt, the diagnosis is different. So um, all that is something you can't do with any other data but workers' comp, basically. So. All right, so you know we talked a lot about this, these webinars and things like that, and trying to help the states, and, and, and you know a lot of lip service in a lot of ways. So what else are we trying to do in terms of getting this sort of idea along to get state-based data? Well, a big thing that we're doing. Next slide, please. Is uh, is is basically trying to build some state capacity through uh, grants. Um, we do have a grant program that it's going to fund up to nine states to really just take the data they're already collecting. Uh, and the idea is to develop a partnership between the workers' comp folks and the Department of Health folks to use the data, combine it with employment data in the state that they can actually get uh, data by industry and cause and rates. And so the funding is, is for nine states, about $200,000 per year for three years. And again, the basic <coughs> idea is that we're going to get this data available, and then the states will make it available to other researchers in the state, and also insurance companies and employers. Anybody who needs to use that data, it will be of, of use within the state. Um, we just are going to fund the first three in the middle of, of this coming year, and then it'll be three in the next year, and so on. So um, basically, it's uh, more, much more to come on that, but we're hoping that it'll help push along at least some of the development of this data to make it more available. Next slide. As far as the roles in the grant, um, we're not leaving states just alone because, again, we're trying to build a community of folks that are really working towards these goals and can and share share some best practices. So I'd mentioned some of these kind of uh, uh, methods development that we're, we're sharing, and so that's certainly something we're going to keep on doing with the states. And it's not going to just, just be the nine that we fund, but really anyone that's interested in, in actually doing these sorts of analyses. And again, in the end, we're just trying to use that data for prevention purposes. Uh, next slide, please. We have actually, if you go on our website, um, we have a number of different uh, products that we're trying to get out. One is just a basic uh, summary of, of how to use workers' compensation data for prevention purposes. And that's that, it's actually on your thumb drive. It's just a PDF to go through in there. Um, we're also putting out things like the papers and so forth, the scientific journals, but also doing presentations like this and webinars. We do have an upcoming webinar on uh, December 4th, and it should be a really good one because it's, it, it's with the state of Louisiana. It's going to go through some uh, dashboards that they, they have developed in their state. And it's the basic idea that, is that they have you know, a map of their state by county, and they can heat map you know, where injuries are occurring, essentially, and in what industries. And, it, and it's, again, it gives a feedback to the employers and insurance companies in the state. So um, it's free. So if you have any interest, uh, uh, please check out the website or let me know, and I can send you the, uh, the link to the actual webinar itself. Um, and if you happen to miss any of these, uh, we can provide the, the presentations all um, by request. So uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of other surveillance, we are really trying to work with a number of partners that have been active in this area over a number of years. So uh, IAI ABC is a, <clears throat> it's a huge organization that's basically uh, composed of the different workers' compensation bureaus in each state. About 40 states have standardized reporting uh, through IAI ABC, and they're very helpful in getting the word out. Um, and they're actually doing a new project where, uh, for the first time, every state's going to produce a number of indicators, um, and they're all going to be rate-based. So it's just basically the number of cases, the number of cases per worker in each state, and then also fatalities, and, and there's about six different indicators that they're working on. So that's a big project for IAI ABC. NCCI is another huge organization that um, Basically, in many states, about 40 states, uh, they do the, the rate setting. So they have the data that the employers and insurance companies have to report. And it, with that data, they use it for the premium setting mechanisms. Um, they've done quite a bit of, of work over the years. And we've partnered with them to uh, do some analyses and, and hope to do more in the future. Um, in terms of getting data that's by cost of information, cost of injuries, 
they have the best interstate data that's out there in terms of just ready, ready to go cost data. Um, another way that we're trying to work with, with really anybody who's uh, interested in working with large data sets is um, we have a, a auto coder that actually codes industry and occupation. So it was designed at first for uh, death certificate data, but we are working right now to optimize it for workers comp data. So if you're missing, if you have an unstructured industry occupation, this coder will standardize the coding basically. And that's available actually on our website as well. Next slide, please. So, so that's all the surveillance aspects of what we're doing. And, and really just relates down to getting the data by industry and cause in terms of number of cases per employee per industry. Um, and that's the basic thing that you need to then start to do research uh, for priority setting and then also uh, evidence-based uh, safety and health. Uh, next slide. <coughs> so again, we are starting to work with some key um, partners, but the other thing is to actually just, if anybody is doing other research, to get that word out about what's working in their state or, or with their insurance company. So next slide. I had mentioned this at the beginning that Ohio had this safety grant since about 1998 where they put in engineering controls at employers. Um, from 2003 to 9, they covered about 468 employers. And so we looked at that, that time period. And what they did is they, again, funded engineering controls like ergonomic or safety devices at a company and they collected workers' compensation claims two years before and two years after for the group that was affected by those controls. And uh, in essence, the, uh, the full report is on the, um, on the uh, thumb drive, but we found that it was very successful, essentially, in, in reducing the workers' compensation claims. Um, Ohio, long before we ever got it published, because it take, took a while to get things published, they basically increased their budget from $4 million to $12 million, in part because of that it was effective. It was demonstrated to be effective through this. So. Um, just in FY14 alone, they funded over 400 uh, employees just this year. So you can imagine how much it's increased because in that whole time period, we were looking at only 400 and something employers. They did more than that just this past year. So um, it is a grant model that we hope other insurers can maybe try to adopt. And it's the idea that uh, you know if you have your recommendations for loss control, perhaps there's a, there's a way that you get directed funds from your premium to pay for those those types of uh, uh, recommendations. So we know that there's obstacles to doing that. It's a state type of system that you have to get, um, you know, the states that agree that that would be acceptable in the state, but about five different states right now have different grant programs that are like that. And so we're hoping that it does become something that others use. Next slide, please. This just gives you some overview of the results. Um, the gray bar is the number of claims for the companies before, and then the green bars are those claims after. So these are just straight uh, counts, so it doesn't take into effect the, the count of rates. Uh, next slide, please. But what we did find is that um, the rate of claims is going down if, if in the far left about 11% per year. We were, we were finding if, if nothing was done, that was kind of what you're seeing as far as the downward trend. But we did some modeling on it and found that if you did put in place this intervention, over and above the 11% decline, you got a 66% decline in terms of the number of cases per, per worker and about an 81% drop in the cost per worker and then also about 30% drop in the cost per claim. So all these things are really good, good numbers. And, um, you know, a big thing of what we did in the paper is, is that Quite frankly, the numbers look too good to be true. And so we went back in and did all these uh, post hoc analyses and looked for something called a regression to the mean, which is if you're high one year and then you do something, you're not sure if, if what you did actually would bring it down or it's just the fact that they were randomly high and randomly low the next year. So we did a whole bunch of testing on that and it, it still held true that this, these look to be very valid results. Uh, next slide, please. So that's on that um, uh, thumb drive if you want more information about it. You can not actually dig into the exact type of, of control, like a conveyor versus a lift table versus a uh, machine guard. It's all, it's all on that paper. But we are doing a number of things with Ohio. They have a wellness grant program, for example, where they're, they're paying employers 
um, some funds to put in place wellness programs, and we're looking to see if it impacts workers' comp claims as well. Um, and we got a number of other ones in play that I'm not going to go into details, but if you go on our website, you can see that, um, some of the information there. Any of these studies, if, if you're interested, we can get you more information about it. Um, Ohio has taken the initiative in the state to fund their own uh, research, basically, as part of this partnership, and uh, they're going to fund universities in their state to then do research as well. And it's all going to be leveraging the, the surveillance data that's used. So, there's other states doing the same thing. Colorado actually has a very similar pr program in that uh, in Colorado, uh, about 70% of the market there is by a company called Pinnacle Assurance, and they gave money to the, the universities in Colorado to form a, a center for research, and they're doing quite a bit of research as well in terms of effectiveness. And so that's something that we're seeing other um, states and universities partner to develop. Um, and so really that brings us to the next point is that you know, we, we started with a, a few key partners, but we're always looking to, to develop more. And in many ways, what we end up being is like a matchmaker. So if, for example, we don't necessarily have um, a research capacity in some area, we can put you in, in contact with the researcher looking for something to do in that area. So that's a main way that we really think that we're going to operate on the research side is put people, interested parties together. So next slide. So really, there's a whole number of different potential collaborators. Every state has the bureau. Um, you do have a number of state-based plans. There's about 23 states, 25 states that have state-based plans. We do work with private insurance companies as well, other federal agencies like, like OSHA, um, the workers' comp organizations that I mentioned, unions, uh, self-employed or self-insured employers. So really, it's the full gamut of, of folks that would like to partner. We're, you know, willing to do that with them. Next slide, please. We are getting together a, uh, a meeting basically in December uh, to get some more input for the center. Um, and this is kind of just bringing in a, a group of folks that have done research in the area of workers' comp for a long time and making sure that, you know, we have goals that are going to meet and be relevant to uh, the needs that are out there and not duplicate things either. That's a big thing is we don't want to reinvent the wheel and a lot of uh, a lot of ways so that's that part of it and I'm, I'm wrapping up here too I don't know if we're, okay <laughs> told you, you guys would be sick of me give me a talk we're we're in our own I've been in the car for about six hours and it's like <laughs> I had too much coffee for one thing <clears throat> so again we are trying to act like this this matchmaker thing encourage internal and external research and continue with this whole idea of trying to build the state capacity um, again, not collect new data, just helping the states leverage what they're already collecting and disseminate it out uh, through the grant and also just doing these webinars and so forth. So, next slide. We are going to continue with the Ohio data. Um, people ask if we're, you know, interested in, in taking on more data, and we we do at different times. But our big goal is that, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing the best with the data we have. And we've learned that 1.4 million claims is a lot of a lot of data to take care of, so we are doing our best to really go through and publish and put out information on the Ohio data and get that out there. And then, as I said, work through uh, this grant program to have this, each state then do kind of the same thing. So um, there's so much data involved in this these states that it, it's really it's going to take a lot of different partners to really use it and leverage it the best that it can be. So it's not all about again us doing it. And a huge area. Just the uh, you know the whole idea of predictive analytics that gets thrown around a lot, um, but it is one of those things that um, that you really can if you look at the data figure out what what is making you know one employer uh, succeed versus another, and that gets into the whole idea of not just the, the lagging indicators from the workers' comp, but also some of the you know the, the safety program type of approaches, the injury illness prevention program I two P two of what's really driving the losses. So that, that's going to be a big part of what we're trying to do in the future. And again, identifying what actually is working to help out and prevent. Uh, next slide, please. We will continue to develop partnerships and leverage the ones we already still have. Um, and again, a big thing of what we're trying to do is prioritize this request. Um, if we can't do it, we'll uh, basically get them in touch with somebody else who perhaps can through we have a lot of students here, and these are the types of things that 
we encourage uh, folks to get involved with if, if there's research projects that have them involved to do it. So, and next slide. And we realize that, you know, when you talk about big data, there's a number of challenges too, and just kind of visualizing that much data. If you, you know, put 1.4 million claims through Excel, it's gonna crash the system. So, but there are different business intelligence tools that are out there um, that really kind of help you visualize all these different trends. And that's what we're really just learning uh, to do. And, and we rely a lot on our partners in the private sector to kind of teach us what they're doing as well. Um, the December 4th webinar that we're having is going to touch on some of these predictive sort of analytics and business intelligence just by how they visually represent their data in the dashboard can help you understand trends and, and kind of the, the heat mapping for the geospatial uh, sort of analysis. So we're really just at the beginning of use of the data, so it's a pretty exciting time. Um, but, you know, again, it's, the, it's about the future and what it, what it holds. So. So in essence, in summary, summation, it's, it's all about encouraging uh, folks from Tennessee, the state of Tennessee as well, to become involved with the center, uh, again, towards this goal of, of identifying trends within the state and publishing it, making it available for uh, industry and, and researchers uh, to use and really develop the best safety practices and interventions that we can and uh, continue to reduce you know, the incidence and severity of, of, uh, of occupational related injuries and illnesses because there's been a lot of success over the last few years and, and now's the time to start to optimize it even more uh, to move forward so and i will say that that's pretty much what i have for the presentation but you know throughout there's going to be a lot you know talking back and forth with, with, with what osha has and then also bls uh, that we can probably you know continue the conversation here so again thanks bill for inviting me to, to come down and talk thank you <laughs> Do you have any questions? Are there any, any questions? No? Uh, it, it sounded to me like Ohio has been sort of a, a leader, innovator in developing this. Do you see other states, you mentioned Colorado, uh, are they patterning a lot of what they're developing in surveillance on workers' comp on their observation and interaction with the Ohio people through you? Um, you know, they have somewhat. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of been, there's been pockets of people doing different things. It's almost like an island community over here and, and there. I mean, Washington State for years has done quite a bit of stuff, but now with Ohio doing a lot, I mean, just Pennsylvania, just, I mean, they have a whole system out that, um, you know, I think in the future you'll be hearing more from them. Massachusetts, Michigan just put out, um, you know, study. So there's actually, a lot of states that are starting to come together. And what what it really comes down to is that um, we're at a time with the technology that there's this electronic data interchange. So the data itself is stored electronically. Once that happens, then basically all these different things can come together that it's really just about tying the data together that you know your state's already collecting. It's again, no new data. It's just leveraging what you have. So, um, you know, Ohio is definitely a key partner, but by no means are we saying that, you know, any one state has all the answers because, you know, with workers' comp, you know one state, you know one state. Every state is, is unique, and that's why we really do encourage every state to use their own data. Listening to your, your talk, my, my conclusion is that most of the data that you've got are coming out of the, uh, the formal sector established company relationships that have, have these sort of the reporting forms. But we know from numerous academic studies of employee misclassifications, and here in Tennessee, we, we finished up a three-year task force on that, and now we have a, the people, it was so since we passed a law uh, in, in July 2013, and now we're uh, continuing with the national task force now called the Employee misclassification advisory committee, but the same people in the same interest, including some of those that you were listening here. Uh, and so, my question is uh, do you do, does, is NIOSH doing any research into those areas of the economy that are not being covered in the surveillance reporting uh, organizational forms uh, to look at sometimes? 20, 25% of workforce is 
underreported, unreported, misclassified as independent contractors, and they don't come up in the same standardized way. Right, right, and and there are. I mean, um, you know, that is you know something with with workers' comp is that it's it's not it's not going to get everything. It it does uh, miss miss injuries, um, illnesses are are definitely one that's more difficult to, to track. Even in a place like Ohio, um, if you're an independent contractor, if you have an employee, you have to have workers' comp. But if you're you're an independent yourself. Sole proprietorships, partnerships don't have to have workers' comp. So, um, and that's that can be you know very difficult that you're missing that part. Um, a number of the partners in different states have actually one of the reasons that they're having partnerships between the workers' comp and Department of Health is they can do studies to look at things like emergency room versus workers' comp, and um, that's one actually this that Michigan just published that looked at traumatic brain injury and it was looking at both the comp and others and so yeah i think that's all big a big part of the puzzle and um you know with the employment data that's in in a way with the denominator even though i didn't go into details here the devil's in the details because when it really with with uh, that data it's it's collected for employment reasons so you know when bls does their their statistics on job creation that comes from the unemployment insurance data in each state it's just an abstract um, but you know each employer does report that, um, and it's it's available through you know their federal tax ID basically. So there are ways that you can try to verify essentially what what the employer should be classified as, and if you have over time, you can see when it perhaps it was out of whack compared to what it was. And so, the same way with the actual denominators, we know that when you get stuff at a real fine detail level, you get some pretty strange sometimes race and you got to look at those outliers and figure out what's going on if it's something that um, you really can't include in the general rates and you only know that when you really look at the detailed level of data but questions yeah. thank you so much thank you and uh, we mentioned, steve mentioned massachusetts uh and, and he may not have looked at our program to see that the um uh, former Secretary of Labor for the state of Massachusetts will be our keynote speaker this evening. And uh, she might be open to some questions from you about what they do in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. You'll have a chance to ask today. So, um, the, our, our, our next uh, presenter on uh, our, our kickoff health session is our old friend Steve Hawkins, who's been a regular feature of our annual conferences for many years. He's currently uh, the administrator of the Tennessee OSHA division in the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development, um, and was appointed to that position in 2012. And so this is really the first time since everything was sequestered uh, last year, the first time that you're here as the administrator of that. So uh, let's all give him a big applause. Uh, for that. Thank you. Um, in this position, he manages the day-to-day -day operations of TOSHA, supervising uh, eight managers and various programs. Uh, and he also serves as a liaison between the state's OSHA program, federal OSHA monitors, and he promotes workplace safety and health across the state by educating employer groups and labor organizations about safety and health regulations and better methods for controlling and eliminating workplace hazards. And uh, I won't take any more of his time because he always has a, a stunning presentation for us. So look forward to you being there, uh, doing your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm really proud of myself. I just downloaded this big clock app. Uh, to keep us on time, Bill, so you'll be proud of me. I should be in right on time. Uh, <clears throat> again, I uh, appreciate the introduction, and I do appreciate the opportunity to come down and speak with you. Uh, I think probably uh, this is the fifth or sixth time, maybe seven or eight even. Uh, but but we do appreciate the opportunity, and we do appreciate the work that Bill does in, in uh, setting this up and especially bringing you all together. So uh, I'll go ahead and start on my presentation because I actually have two and I'll, I'm going to rush a little bit through it. So if you have a question as we go, certainly uh, raise your hand, but I'd like to share all of this information with you. Uh, 
I'll start here. Uh, the only noteworthy item here uh, for me personally is I have a new administrative, uh, or not administrative assistant, but assistant administrator of the TOSHA program, uh, Jim Flanagan. Jim Flanagan was our VPP manager uh, for about 11 or 12 years. Uh, one of the wonderful things about VPP is it actually taught OSHA about safety and health programs. And now, uh, as many of you know, uh, Dr. Michaels is very interested in forwarding that agenda uh, for everyone through the I2P2 program that he has advocated that I don't think is probably going to make it. Uh, he kind of says that himself right now, but certainly it is ultimately the answer of where we need to go, and that is safety and health programs that encompass all the different facets of having a safe workplace that we know about now. Management commitment, employee involvement, uh, and those are really the two keys. Uh, in that program. Management has to be committed and there absolutely has to be ways, uh, ways for every employee to be uh, actively engaged and involved. It can't be a top-down uh, system. It won't work. What we see that most successfully uh, are those systems that have kind of a uh, buy-in at the top and then a grassroots uh, swell uh, among the employees who actually do the work. So I'm excited to have Jim. Those other names have been in place for a long time. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, Tina Klein Douglas is our new training and education manager. So if you have training and education questions, Tina is the person to ask those to. You're welcome to call me anytime and I'll hook you up with her. Uh, and then David Blessman, uh, who's been with us about 15 years total, is now the VPP manager. He, take, he has taken Jim's place and we're excited about that. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, our staffing is the same as it has been for the last three or four years. Uh, it looks good into next year. Uh, we are concerned about the 2016 budget. Uh, with the changes in, in Congress, you just never know what's going to happen. So we are uh, concerned about that because there's a lot of debate as to where this funding might go. But that's what we have, and we have had those same funding, uh, those positions and the same funding level for the last three or four years. Uh, this, this is a slide that I am... Uh, I'm pretty proud of, actually. Uh, the red line is Tennessee. You see the injury and illness rate. Those are recordable, so that's everything that made it onto the OSHA 300 log. Tennessee's the red line. The national average is the blue line. Now, what you see is in 2006, we were quite a bit above the national average. And what you see through 2012 is, well, in 2011, we were the same as the national average. And uh, I know we have several students here, and I, like you, went home and told my parents that average was good, and they bought it about as well as I do now as a parent. But when I was your age, I did try that. I said, look, mother, average is good. And she said, yes, you didn't really buy that. So now I'm trying to tell the commissioner of labor and all you that average is good, and it is good because up here we had a D, and now we have a C. So I see you all smiling. I'd like to know that I'm connecting with my audience and that things haven't, some things haven't changed. Uh, we did bump back up just one tick this last year, but the rate has fallen faster in Tennessee than the national average. Uh, we all want to see that rate go to the bottom of the chart, right? To hit that X axis and stay right there. But we got a little ways to go. Uh, recordables um, among all injury in industries, and that includes state and local government. In 2012, we were at the national average when we put state and local government in with uh, private sector. And that's because the next slide will show you state and local government in CNC is lower than the national average. And I believe that is because a couple of reasons. Number one is in federal OSHA states, there is no protection for public workers. Okay, It's a little bit of a travesty, really, to think that you're in the state of Georgia and you're in a 12 foot deep trench. There's no one, there's no uh, body like OSHA or Tennessee OSHA that can force that employer to pull that employee out of that trench uh, because public workers are not protected in federal OSHA states where federal OSHA is, has prime jurisdiction. And so there's, there's been several bills uh, introduced including the Protecting America's Workers Act uh, that at least in my opinion need to pass, uh, but uh, they haven't passed yet, but public workers deserve that protection. They don't currently have it, but they do in Tennessee. Then I'd like to look at this uh, slide with you uh, very much along uh, with what Steve had to say. 
The fatality rate in Tennessee is still above the national average, and it has fallen. It has fallen steeper, you can see, than the national average, but we're still above that. Uh, there's a couple of interesting things to note. It did fall again this past year. I don't have the rate, and that's why I haven't updated the slide, but the gross number of fatalities in 2012 were 101, and last year they were 93. And so the number of, number of work hours worked, I think, will stay the same or possibly get higher. So we do look for that rate to drop again uh, for Tennessee. Uh, the fascinating thing is Bill asked this question, and I, I, I wanted to wait till I got this slide to talk to you about it. And that is, it's interesting of those 93 in 2013 and the 101 that happened in 2012, TOSHA investigates about 25% of those which means 75% of the workplace fatalities fall outside our realm of jurisdiction. Now part of that is because of automobile accidents, certainly they're large. Uh, workplace violence is an area that we're just really starting to address from a reg regulatory standpoint in a very indirect way. But when you're looking at workplace fatalities, you think, well, what's OSHA doing or what's TOSHA doing? We only affect, if, if we could wipe out every single fatality that we could, it'd still be 75 out of 100 would still occur. So when you look at that number, when you look at that uh, BLS number for, for workplace fatalities, those, per, those uh, rates, just remember that we're, and I don't say that to say, oh, don't hold me responsible, it's only 25% of them. I say that to say there's lots of areas of our economy uh, where workers have no protection. And many of those are indeed self-employed. And self-employed people uh, put themselves oftentimes at uh, undue risk, probably in my opinion because they don't understand the value of the safety devices and the safety methods that are available to them. So uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, as we used to say, unplowed ground. There's a lot of fertile ground out there. The, that field is still ripe. Uh, we can make massive reductions. And why we want to do that, uh, beyond just the moral obligation to try to protect human life, is that's a huge loss to our economy. When you think about there was 101 workers in this state that lost their lives, think of some of the most talented people that you know many times, that's who's gone. And when you lose that, we lose our competitive advantage. And as we realize we're in a world economy, maintaining our competitive advantage is important. And that means protecting the, the lives and the skills of every worker in this state and every worker in this nation. So uh, sometimes I... I'll probably get a little off track and start to sound like a uh, uh, Baptist preacher. Uh, I say that I'm actually Church of Christ, so I should say Church of Christ preacher. But it, there is that component to this, folks. Uh, this is this is real stuff, you know. Uh, we're not. I know that uh, Steve and and me sometimes might be pretty boring speakers. Uh, Steve said he puts you all to sleep, and I said, well, I'll just rock them right on into breakfast here. But really, this, this is important stuff because this makes us competitive. And when we lose people, we lose people that have a lot of knowledge. And especially of those 101, vast majority of those could be absolutely prevented. We could have two or three fatalities in this state instead of 101. Yes, sir. How many of those? I've got a slide. We'll look at them just here in a minute. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, talk about our review commission. These are the people who hear the contested cases that OSHA has. Uh, Russ Farah is the chairman of that uh, committee. Dana Dodson and Ken Gross are the two members. And then our current uh, caseload, I think we have 13. Is that right? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yes. Uh, 13 cases currently contested. Uh, Tennessee is one of the lowest, has one of the lowest contest uh, rates in the nation. Uh, we're in the top when the in the top four or the bottom four, whatever you want to call that. Uh, but we have a very low contest rate, even though our citations per inspection and our penalties are very similar to federal oceans. And I believe that is because we have a competent staff in Tennessee that I am uh, proud to be associated with. Uh, go ahead, one more. <clears throat> Looking at our work we did last fiscal year, uh, we made about sixteen, almost seventeen hundred inspections. Identified a little over sixty three hundred hazards and issued $2.2 million in penalties. Uh, our consultation section did about 426 
visits, identified about 3,200 uh, hazards, and of course they issue no penalties. And what's the real takeaway on this right here? The real takeaway in this is, is uh, our regulatory impact in the state, we concentrate that on manufacturing and construction generally, employee complaints and fatality investigations. But our mandate, our legal mandate, is not to provide a safe workplace. The only mandate I have to provide that safe workplace is for the employees who work for TOSHA. It's the employer's responsibility legally to provide the safe workplace, and we're an oversight agency. Okay, so a lot of times people are confused about that. It's not OSHA's role to provide the safe workplace. It's to provide leadership and guidance and uh, make people wish they'd have provided it in certain cases. But it's the employer's ultimate responsibility to provide the safe workplace. Okay? We'll talk just a second about discrimination. We had 63 allegations of safety and health discrimination filed with our office last year. You can kind of see the breakdown of what happened with those, and I won't read them to you. Uh, but you can see we settled six of those, sent one to the Attorney General. So you can kind of do the math there. Uh, two we sent to Federal OSHA, so two, three, uh, six, ten, about ten out of sixty-three were we ultimately successful for. Many of those people call, they make their complaint, and they never fill out the paperwork, and they never send in their answers. But I just want to remind everybody, there is a law in Tennessee that says you can't discriminate against an employee for raising a safety and health concern in the workplace. And if we're ever to win this battle, one of the battles, one of the fronts that we have to win this battle in is the ability for employees to feel free to raise concerns without fear of retaliation. Uh, if we ever do win it, that'll be one of the ways that we win this battle, is for people to feel free to speak their mind and to ask questions about their own safety and health without fear. We have to win that. Okay, Bill? Uh, our recognition programs, these are our VPP programs and our SHARP programs. Okay. We have three new ones we added. We currently have 40 VPP sites. We added SI Group in Newport, Tennessee, uh, Delta Airlines uh, Maintenance in Memphis, and GE Capital Aviation, which is a remanufacturer and warehouse uh, division of GE who provides parts for planes. So sometime when you're sitting on the tarmac and they say we're waiting on a part, it's interesting to note, it very well may be that someone at GE Aviation in Memphis is walking to a bin, and unfortunately for the people sitting on the plane who think about this, they're pulling a used part, okay, that's been remanufactured, it's kind of like a rebuilt starter from AutoZone, and they're sticking it on a plane out of Memphis and they're flying it to uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they're about to put that on your plane so that you can get to your destination. That's what these folks do. Uh, you know, it, it's actually a, an interesting observation in what preventative maintenance can really do. If you really knew, if they had in big bold letters on the side of the plane what year it was made, a lot of times we probably wouldn't even get on the plane. In some cases, it's before some of you all were born there at the student table, so. Uh, but that's what they do. These are our Sharp uh, partners, uh, Tao Manufacturing, Mueller Refrigeration in Hartsville, and EC, MD, Distribution in Sparta, and there's 18 in that program. Go ahead. Looking at our uh, emphasis programs, and I want some of these are meat slides. And I'll, I'll rush through some and talk more about others. These are the areas that we currently have a special emphasis program. Uh, all of those on that list are national that we adopted in Tennessee, trying to reduce amputations, a national uh, emphasis program on combustible dust, which is now a very well-known hazard. Unfortunately, Tennessee is, uh, has the dubious distinction of being uh, having five fatalities in one facility in Gallatin. The name of that business is Hagenese. They make uh, powdered uh, metal. And we had in two separate incident instances, there were uh, five employees killed in that facility. Two of those were a direct result of, of combustible dust, and three were, or three were a direct result. Uh, two combustible dust played a much more minor role, uh, but nonetheless, it, exacerbated the severity of the incident. Of the incident. Uh, food flavoring containing diacetyl, that is the butter flavor in popcorn. If you work in a manufacturing facility that uh, produces that, and we don't have any in Tennessee, although we did include this, uh, it causes uh, very uh, severe damage to your lungs. 
Uh, hexavalent chromium, hex and chrome 6, you're probably aware of that hazard. Uh, lead and isocyanites are all national emphasis programs that Tennessee adopted. Generally when you see that, what does that mean? What is a special emphasis program? That means in that document it says we will target X number of employers, uh, depending on which one it is, and go out and make X number of inspections to try to raise awareness and also identify hazards. That's generally what, uh, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, if you will, for those emphasis programs. Interesting to note that NIOSH is here. Where stuff like this starts, and I, I started to say this when I came up, uh, Steve is like the, the person in the lab coat. And if, if you're trying to make this analogy, I would be the person in the work boots, okay? Steve and his folks identify these trends far out, do the research, develop, uh, help us develop standards, help OSHA develop standards. And then OSHA is actually the agency who takes the work that Steve and his group does and takes it to the field and tries to uh, affect change in the workplace. Um, but the cool thing is NOSH is where it starts. And uh, of course I worked for 15 or 20 years in my career, had no idea really what NIOSH did. And then as I have become more sophisticated in my knowledge of occupational safety and health, you have a real appreciation of what NIOSH and folks like Steve do. Um, been working with Dave Fosbrook on uh, backing operations. And uh, I guess I'm really I'm speaking to you students more than any, anybody. Uh, about this, if you get an opportunity to ever go to work for a research agency like NOSH, um, it's pretty neat. It's really amazing uh, what they're able to do when they're able to do modeling and, and uh, develop standards and then do research, real, real world research. And a lot of what you see that I'll be talking about, uh, it was born in NOSH. And so that's kind of neat. Uh, emphasis programs continuing national ones with adopted record keeping. Trenching and excavation, we've had this for probably 20 years. If you ever want to look at an area where NIOSH and OSHA made a real difference, it would be as far as lots of places, but if you want to see it in stark contrast, you can look right there. Uh, when I came to work for OSHA 28 years ago, uh, every summer we investigated workplace fatalities in trenches and excavations every summer. Every summer we did two or three a summer. I did two or three a summer. I can remember them, I can tell you where they were, I can even remember names of people that were involved. But these were real people who lost their lives in trenches. And now, I think we've gone three years without a trench fatality in the state. We had one three years ago, several years before that. NOSH started the work, OSHA passed a standard that was workable, that you could understand, that could be applied in the field, and employers, by and large, have uh, done a much better job with that hazard, addressing that hazard. The other neat thing about trenching excavation that's different than many of the, the ones you'll see here is the public, because these are such public exposures, you would be surprised how many calls we still get from members of the public where they say, I just passed a trench, it looked deeper, it looked deep to me, and it was straight up and down. And that's the kind of thing that I get on my iPhone and roll somebody too, as fast as I can get them there. And OSHA does too. Uh, the numbers for fatalities in trenches and excavations, uh, when you look at the, the CDC research, uh, the numbers have plummeted. Which tells us, what does that tell us? That tells us that this can be done. That's what it tells us. Uh, PSM, and then the ones that are unique to Tennessee, carbon monoxide, which I'll talk about in a few, few minutes, falls and noise are unique to Tennessee. Okay, Bill. These are areas where we have specific, specific targeting programs, uh, reducing exposure to bloodborne pathogens, uh, which uh, Ebola is a bloodborne pathogen. And so if you've been reading a lot about Ebola as well as uh, HIV exposure, hepatitis, that's what you're talking about. Construction, metalworking industries, and high hazard industries. Metalworking is there for amputation, okay? A little bit about our outreach this past year. We did several uh, press releases on heat stress, uh, reducing uh, exposure to heat stress and certainly making workers aware of what the uh, signs and symptoms of heat stress are so that they can protect themselves. It's a pretty simple combination. It's uh, rest, breaks, and shade. You gotta have water, a place to rest in the shade. You have to have more frequent breaks. Uh, and that, that simple three-prong uh, approach uh, would save lives and certainly save 
uh, hospitalizations, workers' comp costs, and so forth. Uh, we participated in the stand down for fall protection in the construction industry along with Federal OSHA. It was a national stand down this year. Uh, Safety Fest in Oak Ridge, if you're not aware of that, it's a uh, free training event in Oak Ridge over about four days, and all of the training is free. TOSHA was a co sponsor this year. Also, the Tennessee Safety and Health Congress, uh, 37th annual. We're about to do the 38th, I believe. Uh, and now I do want to bring you, make you aware of the last two. All of our training videos are now online, so if you want to access those, you can. And our newsletter now is electronic. If you will send me an email, I'll add your name to the distribution list. As a matter of fact, even better than that, I will get Bill to, I will send that to Bill every quarter and let him send it to all the members. Yep, and we will do that. We're that's how we've started to approach that with our public information office. So we're trying to get all of our stakeholders like Tara and have them distribute to their members. That way you're not having to give your email address to someone else and be on somebody else's uh, list. So we will do that. Uh, a couple of things in the state that happened last year. Uh, there was a bill introduced that was signed by the governor that changed the chemical list slightly. Uh, previously you had to list the, the chemical and all of its ingredients, okay? And now you just have to list the chemical and we go to the, the safety data sheet to get the ingredients and that's what we were doing anyway. And then also uh, we're in currently updating our rules for the changes to the globally harmonized system of chemical classification and labeling, GHS, that you're already aware of. Uh, so that's what happened last year in the state house, okay? Next slide there, Bill. Uh, looking at what OSHA says they are working on, okay? This is what OSHA is working on. Again, the cool thing is, Steve and Nosh, that stuff starts there and then winds up on this screen. The stuff that he's working on now, you'll see up here years from now, hopefully not too many years, right, Steve? But uh, we'd like to see that faster. Uh, Bloodborne pathogens, that's just a look back, a uh, sunset review, that's not substantial. Combustible dust is a standard uh, that OSHA is working on. Uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, write a rule to address all of the different combustible uh, dust exposures out there and uh, explosion hazards, but it is on OSHA's regulatory agenda. Uh, infectious diseases, that would basically, and here once again, uh, you'll see CDC and National Institute of Health, uh, OSHA would basically take those recommendations and codify them into rule and law uh, for healthcare workers, okay? to try to protect healthcare workers uh, from being exposed to uh, infectious diseases like, we'll say, Ebola, which is all in the news right now. You saw a couple of, uh, one healthcare worker survived, one lost her life, right? Uh, after being exposed to that in the process of trying to uh, render aid. And so that's what this standard would do. Uh, backing over hazards, it's actually, uh, this is one that started with a NIOSH study about the number of people who are backed over in the workplace. Uh, they've now got it on their pre-rule pre on their agenda. And I have the unique uh, pleasure of being the chair of the subcommittee that worked on this for the Advisory Committee for Construction, Safety and Health at uh, OSHA and worked with Dave Fosbrook from NOSH on this hazard. So that's one that's kind of up and coming. So if somebody says, what's OSHA working on? That's one of the items that they're working on how to prevent workers from being backed over by equipment. Um, I, don't, I don't think we had one this past year, but two years ago, two years ago, uh, we had three people killed from being backed over, two of those on the same work site. Okay, it was a big road job, and in both cases on the road job, the backup alarms were functioning. So, uh, and you'd be amazed at the work Dave Fosbrook and Nosh did in identifying ways to reduce that hazard. There's some really neat products out there. Backup cameras are just one. You're starting to see those in your car. Uh, I know we, uh, Tosha, our family, Tosha family, was affected several years. One of our employees, uh, I hate to even tell you this, one of our employees' husband, who drove a delivery truck, went out to his driveway to move the delivery truck and backed in over and killed their two-year-old daughter. And so, uh, you know, Steve and I, a lot of what we talk about, you know, seems real abstract. And so I think it's important to remember what you're talking about. You know, when you're talking about ways to eliminate this, this saves somebody's life, okay? 
Uh, other pre-real stage uh, safety, uh, process safety management uh, and prevention of major chemical explosions that really bore out of the West Texas explosion the fertilizer plant. Uh, shipyard fall protection, uh, communications towers, which OSHA doesn't have a standard. OSHA's trying to draw attention to that now. Uh, about, you know, we all love our cell phones, but we have to remember the people who are up there putting the transmitters on the towers, okay? Not worth losing a life for. Uh, there's not currently a standard. OSHA doesn't have a standard. Two states have standards, Virginia and North Carolina have, uh, their state OSHA programs have standards. Uh, emergency response and preparedness, uh, how to protect emergency response workers, still at the pre-rule stage. Proposed rule, the silica standard would basically be cut in half. Uh, don't know if you all know this, but most of our standards, as far as health goes, go back to 1970 or, or before. Okay, Many of these standards have not been updated since 1970. How much of something can you be exposed to hasn't changed since the 70s. Uh, OSHA started to do this piecemeal, one standard at a time a lot of times. This will be the next one, silica, uh, expected to drop roughly in half. Okay. Uh, also at the proposed drill stage, these are a little closer in, what OSHA is working on. Uh, a standard for beryllium. Um, pretty much agreement even in the industry about beryllium disease. It uh, doesn't affect every single worker exposed, but some are uh, sensitive to beryllium and develop beryllium disease. Uh, working on that one pretty fast, I think OSHA moving pretty good on that one. Uh, standards improvement project, that's really not a major issue as far as safety and health goes. It's just updating the standards uh, and getting rid of duplications, that kind of thing. Amendments to the Cranes and Derrick standard. Uh, there will be a later slide about operator certification. That particular slide is uh, a clarification after they wrote the standard. They've gone back in to clarify the standard about lifting with a fork truck. If you're lifting with the forks of the fourth truck with a hook beneath it, does that make it a crane? It actually doesn't. Uh, there's some cleanup going on there. Okay. Uh, clarification of employers' continuing obligation to do accurate record keeping. Uh, a couple of things there. OSHA kind of OSHA lost a court decision um, about their six-month rule, and so that's part of that cleanup there. Uh, as well as OSHA's working on uh, a proposal where you would report quarterly, and a company's quarterly results would actually be published. And uh, of course, this is at the proposed rule stage, so there's a lot of back and forth about that. Maybe that'd be the nicest way to say it. Uh, operator certification for crane operation was moved to 11 of 2017. It was supposed to take effect this month, and that was pushed uh, three years in advance, or in the future. Uh, updating the consensus standards for eye and face protection, uh, that's basically saying instead of having a ANSI standard that this has to meet that's set in stone, and never changes, OSHA is proposing to update that to say you meet the current ANSI standard plus the previous two. And so, you know, you're, you're talking about this basically a disposable piece of equipment like safety glasses. It's not going to be a major issue for the employer. Uh, confined spaces in construction is at the final rule stage. I would expect that any day now. It says published in summer. We still don't have it. Uh, would expect that it might come out at any time. Uh, right now, workers in construction are not covered by uh, a confined space standard. There's one paragraph, but it, it's, it's really not a standard. And then walking, working surfaces in industry, uh, slips, trips, and falls, updating that to bring it up to the ANSI standard, uh, likely this fall, maybe this winter now. Uh, final rule stage, tracking workplace injuries and illnesses uh, that I spoke <coughs> about earlier. Uh, Go ahead, Bill. I'm going to try to skip a couple of these. They're not. This is uh, this is final rules for discrimination that TOSHA doesn't do, but you can read that list. Those are all uh, national acts that have whistleblower protections. Go ahead. So as are those. Uh, occupational injury and illness recording and reporting requirements. My next slide, I think, will address this. Uh, go to the next one there, Bill. Go ahead and skip that one. Okay, uh, go to one more. I, wanted, I do want to touch this slide just a second, then we're going to talk about the changes to record keeping and reporting. Uh, OSHA has changed their penalty calculations method methods slightly 
Uh, it did raise their average penalty slightly. TOSHA didn't actually follow their lead on that. Uh, I want to talk just a second about incentive programs. It continues to be a big buzzword in OSHA. And that is basically um, OSHA believes that it's wrong to incentivize employ employees in such a way that they would fail to report an injury. And the logic goes something like this. If we're all going to get a, if everybody in this room at the end of this month is going to get a $100 a bonus, if nobody gets hurt, and I get a pretty good cut on my finger, but I think it's something I can take care of when I get home, is there any chance I might just kind of wrap that up a little bit and stick it in my pocket and uh, not knock all of us out of our $100? Do you think that could happen? And I guess the first time I heard this, I thought, well, that's, I'll be honest with you all, I, I thought, well, that's ludicrous. You know, the very first time I heard about it, and then the more I talked to employees, the more I thought about it, the more, and mostly talking to employers, the more it's real. And the more I believe that it is a mistake to incentivize employees in such a way that they might not report a near miss or a minor injury. Now, obviously, if I cut my hand off, I'm going to report that, right? You're going to know about that. But if it's a cut and it, and it was something I could put a Band-Aid on, but I don't go report it because I don't want you all to know about it, uh, because we, I, don't, I don't want my employer to know about it because I want all of us to get our $100 reward at the end of the month. The problem is if the employer doesn't know about that, it might, need, it might be that I could have easily cut my hand off, but I got away with just a cut, okay? And so the employer loses a near miss. And for you folks in the safety and health field, you know a near miss is gold, right? You don't ever want to miss a near miss, right? You always want to know about those. And so, uh, as I said, the first time I heard the argument, uh, my initial reaction was, well, that's, that's silly. But the more you think about it, the more you realize it, it's actually smart. And so where we are, where OSHA is, and TOSHI is, is you can't participate in the VPP program if you have such an incentive in place. And none of ours do. Now, OSHA doesn't have a standard. I can't issue you a citation for having it. But you're not allowed to participate in VPP or SHARP which is our two uh, preeminent recognition programs, if you have such an incentive in place. So what do you want to incentivize? You want to incentivize people reporting near misses, right? I should say if everyone reports their near miss, that's when you get $100. Then I know where my near misses are and I can affect change in the workplace. Uh, if everybody does their safety training on time, there's lots of ways to do leading indicator rewards. If I want to incentivize people, I want to incentivize them to do uh, things that can produce results, not reward you after the fact. Now, if we go that quarter and I decide, I'm the employer and I decide I want to provide pizza for everybody, and it's after the fact, it's not a deal where I will do this if you do that, but just after the fact, one day I get up and say, hey, I think I'll buy, I'll take $300 and provide pizza for all these employees. No problem with that, okay? But it can't be a deal. It can't be a deal on the front end. Any questions about that? I think it's an interesting uh, study in human nature and incentivizing people to do stuff. It's really an interesting thought. Okay, uh, updating the record keeping. This is the new record keeping uh, standard that OSHA just announced. As a final rule, it's actually gonna be effective in January and it'll probably be effective for us somewhere between January and March because there's a lag time for us to adopt things in the state. But they did update the record keeping to the National uh, North American uh, Industrial Classification System from the old SICK system. And all work-related fatalities still have to be reported to OSHA or TOSHA within eight hours. That didn't change. What did change is the second slide, and that is all work-related inpatient, I'm sorry, second bullet, Bill, go back. Second bullet, all, everybody who's admitted to the hospital has to be reported if it's work-related, okay? So all admissions, generally that means you're gonna spend the night, okay? That's not, I went to the emergency room and got stitches and went back home. That's I went to the emergency room, they said this is pretty serious, we're gonna keep you overnight. Now it'd be a little bit of a joke, but you know for them to keep you overnight, you know, it has to be a pretty big deal now, right? You know, uh, I know I had sinus surgery and three hours later they said, oh, you're ready to go home. I was like, no, I'm ready to whip somebody. And uh, anyway, I didn't whip anybody, I was in no shape too. Uh, nor would I, but you see what I'm saying, it has to be pretty serious. Amputations, loss of an eye, 
or any overnight stay in the hospital, basically. If they admit you, it has to be reported to OSHA. Now, what's the jury's still out on exactly what we're going to do with that. First, we're going to have to see what kind of volume that is. But as Steve was talking about, it's going to be some interesting information. You're looking at Washington. I've been talking to the folks at uh, Washington OSHA because they've had that reporting requirement for a long time. And they say they have about 1,000 a year, and their population is a little bit smaller. Worker population is a little smaller than ours. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do with that. OSHA says they're going to respond to every one of those with something, either a visit, a call, something, and we will probably do something similar. Okay, next slide. Uh, let's go to the next one because I, I do want to save a little time here. Fatalities. Go ahead, Bill. In 2013, that's what we investigated. Uh, struck bys were seven. Falls from elevations were five. Uh, lawnmower ZTR, zero turn radius lawnmowers. We had three people killed in this state where those turned over. One of the three had roll bar. The other two didn't have a roll bar. The one that had a roll bar, the roll bar was folded down. Okay. And he wasn't wearing his seat belt. Okay. The ones who don't have a roll bar, bar will not have a seat belt. And now that I've showed you this slide, next summer, next spring, you'll see all these people riding around mowing yards with the rollover protection folded down. Now, you won't be as uh, crazy as me, but I stop. I stop. I stop my car. I walk over there and I talk to them over and over and over. Why are you doing this? Well, there's one limb over there that it'll hit. That's fine. <laughs> when you get over there, use the weed eater or fold it down and then fold it back up. But what you see is they fold them down. They stay that way all mowing season. So if you happen to be like one of your facilities, the people that are hired to come mow the yard, make sure that they've got that roll bar up and they're wearing their seatbelt. They have to do both. Uh, crushed by three, uh, two folks were electrocuted. Uh, removing one of those was removing wire wiring from a 277 volt uh, system. Uh, it was actually a demolition remodel type thing, and they thought they had the power cut off, and went back in. Somebody turned the power on. They were stripping wires out, getting to remodel a building. The other one was a crane contacting an overhead power line. Uh, one thrown from uh, was thrown from an overhead a lift, a articulating boom lift. One chemical exposure and uh, one workplace violence that we investigated. Uh, OSHA does have the general duty clause. TOSHA does as well. We are starting to look at workplace violence in late night retail, social delivery uh, services, and like nursing homes, those kind of things. Uh, when you see workplace violence, don't always think about a robbery, okay? That is where the fatalities occur generally, but also workers in nursing homes and hospitals are actually exposed to workplace violence in high numbers. In the nursing homes, it's amazing how high it is. And you say, well, what can you do about that? When you actually go and talk to the people in nursing homes, there's actually uh, programs you can put in place to minimize uh, patient agitation. Uh, there's uh, actually a science to that now kind of developing of how to minimize violence between the patient and the caregiver. And that's where it occurs a lot. So we're starting to look at that. That one was actually a robbery in, uh, in Knoxville that we actually investigated. What did the employer have in place that could have prevented this? As it turned out, we did not issue any citations. They actually had several items in place. They had a remote re alarm. They had mirrors in the back. They had the front of the store was open. It wasn't, the view inside wasn't blocked. And it was just uh, two drug crazed uh, uh, people came in and robbed the store and shot the owner and the owner shot one of them and, and so the owner lost his life. Okay, Bill. 2014, this is where we are so far this year. I updated this this morning in the office. Uh, nine struck bys, four crushed, one carbon monoxide uh, from a floor buffer, uh, fatality, chemical exposure, one amputation, one electrocution, uh, three people were killed this year in the state so far uh, in fires and explosions. Five falls from elevations. You won't see slips, trips, fatalities, although we all but had one of those. One of those five falls was actually a 30-inch fall. And the 30-inch fall, there was a medical complication that developed after it. So what that, the takeaway from that is slips, trips, and falls from the same elevation. Steve could show you research that shows that. It can result in fatalities, just like it can lower back strains. Uh, and it's about head injuries. That's what it's about. And so this person 
uh, actually wasn't a head injury, he threw a blood clot. He had a broke, he broke a bone and then he threw a blood clot. He died from a 30 inch fall. Uh, and then the total this year so far we've investigated is uh, 26, 26 fatalities uh, in the state to date, okay? Uh, I think that's the last slide that I have, Bill. If you'll, if you'll click over to that other one, I'll spend just a few minutes. I, I think we're still on time. Yeah, uh, I wish we had a little more time. It was just uh, St. Thomas Midtown is one of our BPP sites. It was the Old Baptist, and they got mentioned in an ergonomics publication about their uh, success with patient handling, which is a ergonomic risk factor in hospitals. And they developed a really advanced system of patient handling procedures, and it was mentioned in uh, one of the OSHA publications, which we thought was flattering for our state and for them. Uh, looking at 2020, 2013, I, this is a slide presentation that I have uh, about the fatalities that we investigated. I will skip some of these uh, because I know our audience hears some, but I want you to look at these. Uh, that, we already kind of talked about that breakdown, Bill. Go ahead and go to the actual photographs. <clears throat> I just think it's a value to a group like this to kind of see in this state how did, I think it was, was the number 23? How did 23 people lose their lives in the state at work last year? Uh, and if we had more time, I would give you my, my sobering reminder of how important these 23 people are to a lot of people in this state. Uh, it always bothers me that we rush through and talk about statistics, especially when we're talking about fatalities. But you gotta remember, this is somebody's son or daughter, somebody's daddy, somebody's brother. Uh, it's just really important to remember that as we look at this. Uh, this was where a worker was using this uh, scaffold to step between the, uh, basically to gain elevation. It was stepping on and off the roof. Nobody saw him fall. He was gonna step off the roof that was in process of being put in place and, and for whatever reason lost his balance or lost his footing and fell in his head on this concrete. Lost his life, okay Bill? And this was not a fatality, this was where uh, several teachers and several students went to the hospital for carbon monoxide exposure. Uh, I don't guess anybody happens to have a laser pointer with them, do they? I, I have one with me sometimes, but I forgot to get it. Do you see that rusted out area right there at the top of that picture? That was the heat exchanger, and the heat exchanger had rusted out and basically filled the school up with carbon monoxide. Now, what's the rust out's not the problem. It's maintenance of that piece of equipment that's the problem, right? Okay, there was no fatalities, but several children and several teachers went to the hospital, okay? Uh, worker underneath this, working on the brake system, looking at the brake system, another worker got in the truck and moved the truck while he was under there. Uh, just a reminder that lockout tagout applies to all stored energy and potential energy. That's exactly what this is. What uh, more forward thinking employers would do there they develop a procedure where a procedure where the mechanic has that's doing the work would have the keys to the truck in his pocket and they put a big cover over the experience over the steering wheel that says this equipment is locked out. So there is ways to prevent this, okay? Uh, <clears throat> this was a, a truck driver who was killed when he was walking around the facility and the driver of this uh, front end loader at the bottom was driving with the bucket half raised. Standard actually say it'd be all the way down, but it was right raised up blocking his view. The person came around behind the truck and he was struck by the bucket as the driver of that truck was, was driving. It goes to operator training mostly, okay? <clears throat> Worker uh, stepped back out into the traffic. That's a kind of a reenactment kind of thing, but stepped back out into the lane of traffic to retrieve his hard hat that blew off, was struck by a vehicle. Okay. Uh, in this case, in this instance, a worker was had welded two hooks onto that piece of steel that you see laying flat. Oh, I'm not blocking anybody's view here. Uh, laying flat there, the weld broke, the steel fell, it was suspended by a crane, he was moving it, and he was struck by it, and uh, struck in the head and was killed. Now this is one of the three rollovers for the lawnmower. Uh, that, was, that particular one you can see actually had the rollover and it was folded down, he was mowing this bank. Now, I don't know if anybody has a ZTR, but here's the thing. If you go look at a ZTR, 
it says you can use it on like a 1% slope or flat ground. And that's, that is a steep slope. On two of these, the worker normally used a uh, weed eater, string trimmer, to do the trimming. And for this particular day, they said for the first time ever, decided to use the, the, the uh, mower. Uh, two workers lost their lives here when this wall blew over in Hendersonville. Uh, they were on the backside, and one was doing waterproofing on the wall, another one was in a ditch laying the storm sewer, and the wall was not adequately braced. There's a masonry standard that says you have to brace walls uh, until you get them tied in at the top. It wasn't braced properly, not even close. There was also some construction defects in that some of that steel was supposed to extend up. As you see right there, it was actually supposed to extend up in the block and it didn't. And then be poured as a core. The wind picked up, blew the whole wall over. When I say this whole wall, it was probably as long as this building. It was a very long wall and it killed two workers in Hendersonville uh, last year. Uh, that's another picture of that same wall, okay? Another overturned, over, another overturned ZTR on a bank. All three of these turned over mowing a steep bank, okay? The next one, Bill. Uh, this was uh, two workers uh, moving a, a machine control panel that was enclosed, encased in that uh, container that you see on the left and they had it on these dollies that were on the right and they were pushing it to its location. Didn't have it strapped to the dollies and it became unsettled and fell over and struck one of the workers and killed him. Um, we had two loggers. This is where one logger was killed, fell in trees. Uh, the, the tree that he was felling hit another tree. That tree broke off and came back up the hill and struck and killed a worker. Okay. Uh, this was a, a, these people build silos for the asphalt business, and they were, this, this dolly that you see on the bottom, uh, these rolls of steel, these, these cylinders of steel are welded together, welded together, they were moving it, and uh, it became caught, it kind of got in the bind, and he was moving it himself, it flipped off and hit him in the head right there. Uh, had a worker who uh, left the truck to uh, raise the, uh, the jack right there under the trailer, uh, didn't put the truck in park, the truck rolled back and caused him to be squeezed in that in between those two trailers. Okay. Uh, was, <clears throat> this one, a worker was lifting a compressor from the ground uh, with a device that a little blocking pulley that he got somewhere, the employer didn't provide it. He got it off another job site, somebody gave it to him, he decided to use it. He had it rigged to that beam, he was pulling it, the rigging came loose where he'd rigged it and basically pulled him, he couldn't let go of it fast enough and pulled him off the edge of the building. Uh, this was a robotic arm that was being uh, repaired that was not fully locked out, was not brought to zero gravity. Uh, and basically when they did part of the repair, the part that was suspended failed and struck the work. And <coughs> the gravity is one of the areas that of course you have to address, okay Bill? Uh, this is our third uh, ZTR mower, mowing that bank again, turned over. So if you see this, folks, if you're doing it, stop. If you see this, if that's your facility, you need to raise it to your safety director or whoever can uh, affect change with whoever contractors out there mowing your grass, okay? No reason anybody needs to get killed mowing grass, right? It needs to have a rollover bar, and besides that, when it needs to have a rollover. You need a seat belt if you're operating on it. <coughs> if you look at the manual that comes with these, it's not for mowing steep banks. It's not what it's for. I don't remember the exact number. It's three or four percent grade is all you're supposed to operate these on. They are not designed to be operated on a steep grade. Uh, this was the electrocution that we talked about earlier where they're pulling wires. The problem was they turned the power off. They didn't lock it off. They came back several days later, assumed it was still off, and didn't go verify that it was still off. And you know, the, many of you know this, but there's a, there's a device that you can have in your pocket uh, that you can touch that wire and it'll tell you it's hot. There's a $4 device right there that can keep that from happening. And we all need one at home. If you don't have one at home, you need one at home, okay? Go ahead, Bill. Uh, <clears throat> this, was a, uh, this, was, this occurred at Bridgestone, actually, which is a steel worker. Uh, you know, they're organized the uh, rubber workers there. Uh, working on this uh, tire machine, and one of two things happened. Uh, either 
that safety mat that you see at the bottom is, so, is supposed to sense the presence of the person standing there and keep the machine from operating. There's two problems. This guy was not real tall. Some people said they had seen him stand on that blue bar that protects his toe controls. You know, that's where you stick your control up and operate the machine with your foot so you can do something with your hands. Either you're standing there or one of the four quadrants, if you can picture that mat divided into four quadrants, is either that or we did find that one of the quadrants in that map was faulty, had an intermittent fault. So it could have been that he was standing on the map and didn't sense him, or he was standing up on that bar. But either way, he should have been better protected, and the newer machines had better protection than this. So uh, that's what happened right there. And that's a tire building machine that you see. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a rubber plant, but a tire, a tire is a complicated piece of equipment. Was also under training, and yep. he decided to work with Drake, and he was a trainer when I was Drake, and he was out there working. He was out there working. I, I, now that you said, I remember that. <coughs> Did you also know about the safety mat? Had a little Yeah. So, and then there was some, because nobody knows exactly what happened. Could have been there to stand on the bar. I think he started standing on the safety 